Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bursapuya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the tragic earthquake in Iran and the corruption and ineptitude of the Islamic regime of Iran. Interview this week is with Rana Ahmad Saudi, women's rights activist and ex-Muslim. Our insane fatwa is of a conference of the Flat Earth Society and our slice of life is the release of the wonderful labor activist Mahmoud Salehi from prison in Iran. Don't go away, stay with us. The earthquake in Iran has been a huge human tragedy. We know that hundreds have been killed and tens of thousands wounded. And of course, one of the things that's become very clear about this earthquake is the level of corruption within the government. Buildings have collapsed in a way that they would never have collapsed had it been Japan. Yeah, absolutely. In any other country, in, this is 21st century. And when you see the pictures of people sleeping on the streets for many, many days with no support from any uh, rescue organization or any emergency organization, it's just unbelievable that this is happening in 21st century, only under the Islamic regime of Iran. And what we're seeing, of course, is that a lot of the help that has reached people is help that the public are giving. Uh, there are videos and, and footage of lines and lines as far as the eye can see of cars of private individuals trying to get to the affected areas in order to help but nothing has really come from the state and in fact the Iranian regime has refused uh, re you know um, foreign uh, assistance as well in this situation because they said they don't so need needed. it they said they, they actually don't need it and part of the argument is, uh, is been by the, the herds of the mullahs and Islamic regime mercenaries is that you need to pray to God, this is kind of some kind of punishment and also so actually shirking responsibility from the state, very compatible for reduction of rolling back the frontiers of the state. The state and you know, you know, institutions have no responsibility towards people and that exposes the rule of religion in reality of life, that they take no responsibility for anything and leaving people to, to fend for themselves. And that's also been happening in Iran. Yeah, and of course, it's, you know, it's, uh, the point is too that after such a huge human tragedy, people need immediate help. One, because you can actually rescue people who might be trapped under buildings. The longer that effort takes, the less likely you are you to be able to do that. So people dying unnecessarily, but also stories of people freezing to death, children, women, men, freezing to death because they haven't received tents and blankets and some of the basic things that are yes. really necessary. So everybody rushed in Iran from different parts of Iran. They've been trying to rush individuals, groups, you know, they've just self-organized groups try to uh, come to rescue and help people and that's the only thing that is holding people up and everybody's upset and angry with the Islamic regime of Iran who have been dis disastrous. The other thing, Mariam, uh, that's actually just exposed the whole building industry, corrupt building industry in Iran, which is run by the various arms of uh, Sepa Pastoran or the, um, uh, the Islamic regime military uh, organizations who've uh, you know, the, the cheapest possible method of uh, building, which uh, they've just fallen on people. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the reasons why so many people have lost their lives is because of the way buildings have uh, been constructed yeah, and by even, the corrupt uh, there's organizations. There's even been evidence now that all the government built buildings have collapsed completely and there's lots of privately built ones that haven't to that extent. And so it's very, very clear that there is this great level of corruption and lack of care and lack of basic standards. Yes, yeah, so everybody's uh, um, trying to help through um, private organizations from you know self-organized uh, groups, civil society trying to reach to help people earthquake in Iran didn't have to take so many lives and leave then tens of thousands of people homeless and children without any any support
Uh, Rana Ahmad, such a pleasure to have you with us. I want to talk to you first about the photo in Mecca with the Atheist Republic sign. Tell me about that. Uh, in this moment, I was really afraid. I was weak. It was really such a mixed uh, feeling. You are ex-Muslim, you are atheist, and you are here in this place uh, with two million or three million Muslim. I want to say with this paper, I am not alone. If you come here, you are not alone. If you are here, you are someone else here. I want to say help me for all the world. I want to send message also for the government in Saudi Arabia. You don't let the people to be free in the religion. There is ex-Muslim come here. There is atheist come here by force, by the family. They don't have choice. If you don't allow the freedom of religion, this is what will happen. I think also the Muslim society, they will not be happy if you are ex-Muslim or you are Kafir or atheist and you are in Mecca. So there is no freedom, there is no accept for us like ex-Muslim, this is what will happen. And I think I am not alone, only the one girl go there by force by the family. Before I carry on, those things are showing your... Uh... Yeah. And also uh, stay back a bit for the table. Okay. Because I think it's going to shake. Okay. So when you went to Mecca, did you go with your family or was it something you planned to do? No. How, what was the background? Uh, my mother was thinking something wrong with me. She was thinking maybe Rana, she not believe anymore. Maybe Rana think different now and she want to be sure I am not something else. Only Muslim and she uh, she planned to make this trip. I don't want to go. I do everything. I say I am sick. I have a lot to do in work. My mom, please, I don't want to go. But she wants to make me really clean from inside. She wants me to go there to make this hajj. And we go. And in this moment, when I was going, I feel really sad. I want to cry, but I can't. You can show your feeling for your Muslim family. You have to be smiling, happy, because you will go there. But from inside, I was like, something kill me. And by this photo, I want to say, I am suffering. Please, someone come. Please, someone help me. Uh, I want to say for the government, I am here like Kafir. Did you all accept that? It's interesting that you saw it as a way of asking for help. For us who saw it, it looked like such a strong act of resistance. It's it's looked like someone is strong, but I don't was. I know if someone see me take this photo, I will be killed in this moment. But I don't care. I was only. I want to show the world. We are like atheists forced to go there. We are like ex-Muslim forced to go there. Did someone know that? I think other people say this photo think I am really strong, I want to make something against Islam, but I only want to respect me like ex-Muslim. I only want to respect me like someone don't believe in God. Please leave me alone. Yeah. What are some of the other um, aspects of the fact that you were ex-Muslim in Saudi Arabia? This pressure to do things that you didn't want to do is one aspect. Tell me a bit about the others, also the fact that you're a woman. Um, like women, you can talking about zero rights in Saudi Arabia for women. So you are ex-Muslim, you want to go out, you can't. You want to have your flat or your room, you can't. You want to do something to get out from your family or from the society, you can't. Because you are women in Saudi Arabia and Muslim society. So I was really thinking from long, long time. I was crying in my bed. I say, please someone come to help me. I don't notice that, some, that someone will help me. It's me. If I plan, if I have power, if I think about really where to get out from there, it will, it will done. It will be really like really. And this is what happened. I was planning for more than two years to get out. But after two years, it's, it's done. You, you do lots of protests uh, against the veil, the, the niqab and uh, all-encompassing hijab. Uh, tell me how it felt to wear it and also why you think this sort of protest is so important. Uh, like an uh, atheist wearing hijab every day, like a Muslim woman, and from inside you are not and I have photo show how it's this mix for me. I was drawing like a face in my hand and I was putting the top and I do it for myself. 
I want to see my life in my eyes to have like Bauer Rana get out from here and also this photo like published everywhere because it's really show you someone really atheist from inside but from outside Muslim even for Muslim girl I, I was here something like from Muslim girl they say I don't want to wear hijab I don't want to wear niqab I am Muslim but I don't want to do that I know my religion I know my God but I don't want to do it but they don't have choice in our society in Muslim or in Saudi Arabia or in Middle East in general so what what do you feel now that you're out? I mean, there's so many problems still out here as well. Cultural relativism, tolerance for, uh, you know, everything from the Negev to Sharia courts. How do you feel now that you're out? And uh, what do you feel you need to do still? Um, I want really to push uh, Europe or uh, Germany special. First, to forbidden uh, hijab for children this is really important i don't know how the society like europe accept that and say it's normal when you say children like girl five or six years put this in her hair did you think you are pedophilia society and we are we have to do that or what's the point to accept that no one can feel what this girl feeling i was worrying that when i was nine or ten years i know what i was feeling i i live with that i know how she feel i don't want anyone to suffer i think in the future i will i will try to do something to agnes that and also to agnes niqab or burqa we are in open society everyone not feel shame from his face why you are shame here you have right, you have your choice. I, I think there is no woman choose to wear that. I don't think so. And what's this uh, new project also, Asylum uh, for Atheist Refugees? Explain what you're yeah. doing. Um, after what happened to me, after I get help from Atheist Republic, from Ex-Muslim Britain, from all amazing people I know from internet, I was thinking here in Germany, we have really to build an organization, not only GBS or ex-Muslim uh, Deutschland, we have something really to help other with name atheist, and we built something atheist refugee help. This it will be like helping supporting atheist refugee by money, help, by contact, by network. Do something really to help them. Uh, we start like three people, me and other two friends in GBS, and then we start to be more big and more, and then we have this organization. We, ha we hope by this one can really help other ex-Muslim or atheists in this world. So, tell me um, about contacts in Saudi Arabia. I'm sure there are people who contact you uh, and who are inspired by what you've done. Uh, Talk a little bit about that. Um, I feel really heartbroken when I hear from girl Rana, please do something for me. When I know she don't have password, she don't have any way to get out. I feel like if I have, la if I, if I have airport, I will send all my flat to get this girl here. I I feel like really sorry. I feel like how it's come now in 2018 we will be and still there is women they can get out from their house they can do simple things like walking in street like removing them cover like talking with other people it's something really make you really feel bad from this and you know because Saudi Arabia is a rich country with the oil, no one can do anything with this country. You can't fuck your, your people, there is no problem. But from other way, I will try in the future to make law to protect this woman, not only in Saudi Arabia, even in other countries. Uh, one final question is, um, you know when you talked about being in Mecca and you were feeling so desperate and so... Uh, you. you it was like a cry for help. Yeah. How do you feel now? I feel I am proud about myself. I can't say that because now and every day I walk here in Germany, I feel like, Rana, you did it. Rana, you deserve to have your freedom. And I feel like in every moment, I want to bring more to this feeling. All, all the girls, they have to really feel what I feel. Like, I, if I can share it in any way to all the girls in the Muslim society, I will do it. Everyone really deserves to be free, not only me.
Just one final question. You uh, speak German now? How yeah. Have you been here? <laughs> I speak German now. I have to speak German because I want to study nuclear physics or quantum mechanics. So I really need to have to work fast for my language. I am now in like a preparing year for university and I think next year I will start my university. Brilliant, brilliant. Good luck with that. Thank you, thank my darling Anna. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.